Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we convene our fourth of five programs on the extraordinary impact that glyphosate has had on the world ecology and on human health. This has been one of the hardest hitting programs we've ever had on Humanity Rising. We've heard from scientists, we've heard from journalists, we've heard from activists about how Monsanto and other companies have introduced into the market beginning in the 1970s and 80s, a poison called glyphosate that was linked to genetically modified organisms, was uh, the central uh, poison uh, in Roundup, which is now sold globally, which when combined with the other additives uh, in that toxic brew, began to wreak havoc on just about everything in the environment, including human beings. And we've heard day by day how in the face of incontrovertible facts, Monsanto keeps going, keeps lying, while people continue to die and have all kinds of birth defects and, and uh, physical challenges. And now glyphosate is in the entire world ecosystem and in the body of virtually every human being on earth, wrecking its havoc. It's an extraordinary thing to take in. That's something that none of us have really ever seen. Most of us wouldn't be able to spell the word uh, as having such a devastating impact on, on uh, the well-being of our environment and the well-being of human beings and keeps going through the mechanisms of industry capture, whereby the Environmental Protection Agency and the Center for Disease Control and a range of, of uh, organizations and institutions in the United States and Europe and around the world are literally subverted by the industries and don't take seriously their public accountability uh, to protect uh, the health of us all. So we, are very pleased that we have today uh, someone that we'll introduce in a moment that will just sort of round out our understanding of glyphosate and what can be done to rid the environment of this poison. Before we do, uh, let us just take a moment to just pause and breathe together. In a moment, you'll hear the sound of a bell. When you hear the sound of the bell, just breathe in very slowly for about five and a half seconds. You'll hear another bell and just breathe out. We're going to take 10 breaths together to breathe as one, to bring coherence to our bodies and minds and emotions, and to bring coherence to our global community that's uh, beaming in today. Thank you, everyone. Let us breathe together.
Thank you, everyone. It's worth noting in the face of glyphosate that uh, just coherent conscious breathing optimizes all our body fortifications and immune systems and balances our sympathetic and parasympathetic systems and empowers our heart and brain to work together. So as we know, we've got glyphosate in our bodies and in the food supply, breathing deeply and consciously is a way each day that we can give our systems what they need amongst other things to do what needs to be done to protect our own health. So thank you for breathing together again today. It's my pleasure now to introduce my very good friend and colleague, Tom Eddington, who is the convener of this program on glyphosate within the context of a big question that Tom is asking is, how did we get here? And over the next several months and as humanity rising progresses, uh, Tom will be asking this question again in uh, other domains. Uh, so Tom, thank you so much for convening this program on glyphosate, and I turn the program over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And I'll uh, I'll invite you to uh, to stay as uh, as we're still waiting um, uh, for uh, for Josh uh, or for Zach Bush to join us. Um, I just got a message from his assistant saying that the uh, the link isn't working. So let me see if I can uh, get her. Uh, yeah, why don't you do that, and I'll just say a few words uh, uh, more about Tom. Uh, as you know, Tom is the uh, chief executive officer and founder of a really an extraordinary organization called Endangered Global that has convened programs uh, on humanity rising before, really looking at the million endangered species around the world, including the human species. <laughs> uh, that are endangered by the rising turbulence in our ecology. Uh, he's also uh, an executive coach and has deep executive experience and is on the A-team as we transition uh, Humanity Rising to a Humanity Rising Network and uh, has been doing all kinds of spreadsheets and financial models and so forth as we uh, prepare to really expand our offering from one channel today, which has sort of been my channel to other channels on youth and health, democracy, uh, climate change, uh, and a range of other issues that are all code red issues uh, in our time. It's really extraordinary. Glyphosate is a code red issue and has been a code red issue for decades now. Climate change, similarly. Democracy, the threat to democracy. So we're dealing with multiple, multiple uh, code red issues. And the latest one, as you all know, is, is Ukraine. We, I've been taking in the reality that this transfer of Leopard and Abrams tanks to the Ukrainians is really a watershed moment. The war is now seriously escalating. And I don't know whether everybody has taken in the the capacity of these tanks. The Leopard tank that the Germans have been uh, developing uh, has a range of 500 kilometers. And the Abrams tank can shoot a, a similar 120 millimeter shell, these big, huge shells, a thousand kilometers. Just take that in. That means a little tank, Abrams tank sitting in the suburbs of Chicago can destroy most of New York. And what does that mean? That means the Russians now have got to start blanket bombing Ukraine to get rid of the tanks. And they already started it today. So this war is seriously escalating now. And we all need to take it in and stop it as quickly as we possibly can. Because the U.S. isn't taking in, you know, Iraq or Syria or Libya, small countries that it can easily defeat. It's taking on now the other superpower on planet Earth. The United States and Russia are the superpowers on the planet. 
And since the end of the Second World War, the United States and the Soviet Union, the United States and Russia have been really dominating world affairs. We'll say more about that, but I want to uh, acknowledge that Zach uh, uh, Bush has come onto the program. Uh, and I will uh, rename you, Zach, because uh, I know you're not Tom Eddington. Uh, you don't even look like Tom Eddington. <laughs> I appreciate so Tom, that. I'll turn the program back over to you uh, with many thanks, and uh, we'll circle back when you call me back in. Welcome, Thank you, Jim. Zach. Welcome, Zach. Uh, delighted to have you on the show today. Um, I'll uh, I'll just spend a couple of minutes uh, sharing with our, our viewers from around the world uh, a little bit about your background uh, from your bio and uh, spend a little bit of time just uh, talking about the week before we get into our conversation. Beautiful. So um, uh, Dr. Bush is a physician specializing in internal medicine, endocrinology, and hospice care. He has a internationally he's an internationally recognized educator and thought leader on the microbiome as it relates to health, disease, and food systems. Um, Zach founded a Serafic Group and the nonprofit Farmers Footprint to develop root cause solutions for human and ecological health. His passion for education reaches across many disciplines, including topics such as the role of soil and watery ecosystems in human genomics, immunity, and gut-brain health. His education has highlighted the need for a radical departure from chemical farming and pharmacy, and his ongoing efforts are providing a path for consumers, farmers, and mega industries to work together for a healthy future for people and planet. And I'm especially delighted to have you here today. We started Monday's conversation with a, a couple of uh, folks who've been bringing attention to glyphosate, whether it's through GM Watch or uh, reporting and, uh, and books. We had a, two of the leading scientists on Tuesday sharing uh, their experience of their research on glyphosate in particular, but other, uh, other uh, chemicals used in agriculture. Yesterday, we had the attorney who represented the law firm that won a $10.9 billion lawsuit against Monsanto. And yesterday's conversation surprisingly drifted into both soil microbiome and uh, human biome. And so it's it was perfect uh, segue into our conversation today. And I'm especially delighted to have you here in that, you know, I've, I've been watching your talks, interviews you've done over the, the last several years. And from, from my vantage point, you're one of the, the leading minds on the planet. And I'm just delighted to have you in this conversation today. So that's welcome. A, that's very generous of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's uh, been a very fascinating couple of decades of human science that has really pointed us back to the soil. And uh, it's an exciting thing that you guys have brought to attention. So I really appreciate what you're doing with the summit here. It's a really a uh, neat opportunity for us to recognize that uh, this isn't just one activist or one scientist or one thing. This is a, a global community that's now recognizing really the root, root of what we've done. How, how did we create the chronic disease epidemics that are leading to human extinction? How did we create global collapse of topsoils that are now threatening the, the biologic cycles of life on earth uh, to create the sixth extinction event here? So um, but it's such a huge topic. You know, it's the most existential thing that we'll ever face as humanity is our own extinction. And yet there's a tendency to think, well, maybe we don't know what's going on. Maybe, you know, no, nobody really knows. Maybe Mars is the answer, you know, whatever it is. And so I really appreciate the opportunity for us to all come together and be acknowledge that the science has been pointing us towards this, this reality of a root cause and the root opportunity to transform everything in these next few decades with a concerted vision of where, where we can go instead of where we are going. <laughs> and so that's kind of where we're at. And so I'm, I'm excited about where you outlined there as to kind of what's already been said this week, because it's, it is a mind boggling body of science that is redirecting us right now that has emerged from the last 20 years. And from my perspective, which is only one of the facets out there, but from my perspective, it was really the, the dawning of our understanding of genomics that really laid the roots for, for what we now understand about the relationship between soils and humans. 
And so that genetics has been so fascinating because we've been able to now decode regions or, or ecosystems within the body uh, at the genetic level to find out that to be human is far from being a species. To be human is to be an organic garden of diversity at every niche of the body. You know, even by the 1980s and 90s, when we started to come to terms with the fact that bacteria weren't all bad and maybe they were good bacteria, and then to emerge that, oh my gosh, all bacteria are good. We had all, we really kept that relegated to the colon or the intestines in our heads because we wanted to believe that a sterile human body was the healthy human body. And we had to have an, a warring immune system to, to sterilize the human experience so that we can survive. If there were, God forbid, bacteria in the bloodstream, that would be you know, sepsis. If there was bacteria inside of an organ, my God, that'd be an abscess. If there was, we now know that there is bacteria teeming in every single aspect of it. And then the holy of holies, the, the human brain has an <laughs> organic garden within it, which is bacteria, fungi, yeast that are naturally occurring in that space to not only coexist, but actually to nurture that system into its full potential. And then within the human cells, the big discovery is that we have bacteria that are living within each cell. And this is a large population. This is 14 quadrillion bacterium living inside human cells. We long called those mitochondria and we thought they were part of the human machinery. We thought that mitochondria were an aspect. I was taught in the 1990s that these are organelles, which is to say one of the organs of the human cell and they were the power plant of the human cell. To find out that they actually are bacteria that have their own genome and they proliferate inside our cells for their you know, purview of life is, is hugely difficult to wrap our heads around and because we're now realizing that to be human is to be a complex ecosystem. And this gives us a lot of understanding then as to why and when we started to use widespread antibiotics in the form of herbicides across our food system, did human health suddenly collapse? Because we'd seen that correlation, but the companies that were making the herbicides, pesticides, and the regulators that were regulating those herbicides, pesticides, couldn't get any good science as to what the causation would be. Well, we know that human health is collapsing. We know we started spraying all of our food with these herbicides in the 1970s. So we see the correlation. We see cancer going up for every acre of Roundup we spray. We see it going up, but that we can't figure out why. So we shouldn't, right? You know, we won't change direction. <laughs> and so... That continues to be the position of the EPA. So our team has been testifying at the EPA the last few years with, uh, with hundreds of other scientists. We present 196 scientific studies demonstrating the direct human damage from glyphosate in our foods. And the EPA came back with, well, this sounds like something we can't turn into a regulatory document because we don't know enough about how the direct cause is really linked. And so the direct cause is the human body is an ecosystem. It's, an, it's it is a garden that blooms from our own soil, which and that soil is no longer limited to the intestines. It's really within every single organ system, and now within every single cell. And so we are the ecosystem, and what we do to the ecosystem happens to us. And this is a very important turning point for humanity when we realize that for every action, there's an equal and direct relationship to that injury to our own children. And so that's the pivot point that we're at now is, oh my gosh, we know the cause of the collapse of human health was that we moved in with chemicals that destroy the anti, the microbial you know, foundations of life in the soil and within the human. And so this is a, a really exciting moment in that, my goodness, we actually know where human life comes from for the first time. It comes from a nurturing nature. And that mother who would give birth to a, a fetus will not give birth to a live fetus, what we would call an infant, without her support of the ecosystem within her. And so live birth as a mammal species, as a mammalian species, is necessarily related to the ecosystem within us, which is directly related to the ecosystem around us. And so this is where we're at now. I would like to give a little perspective on <clears throat> what this, you know, chronic disease epidemic started as and, and the exact mechanisms by which glyphosate has been responsible for this. This has been my basic science lab's passion and purpose for the last 10 years is what is the direct cause?
cost of this because when you're tired of the correlations, we know you can't make regulatory decisions. So what is the direct function and cause of this molecule glyphosate and the way in which it's undermining human health? And one of the biggest breakthroughs has only happened in the last six months. And this was actually, as all science and scientific discovery typically is, was discovered by accident. And so you ask one question and you accidentally get new information that completely changes your original question and your original premise that had you on a question. And so this happened to us about six months ago because we were very fascinated previous to this about the breakdown of, of tight junctions, which are the barrier systems between compartments in our body. And the new glyphosate was doing this. We showed that 10 years ago. So we were very focused on that. What unfolded rapidly in the last six months is a realization that the very first injury upstream of the damage to protein structures and parts of the body is a collapse in metabolism at the mitochondrial level. And so the mitochondria is a little bacteria living inside our cells. And what we've been able to show is that glyphosate immediately within seconds of contact of the human cell membrane enters the cell and stops ATP production, which is a very dramatic demonstration of the disruption of life. How do you engineer extinction of many species? You stop ATP production. And so what is ATP? ATP is the fuel that human cells run on. This is basically the process of turning large carbon chains of glucose and fatty acids, which are the fuel within your food, into light energy. And so by breaking the carbon bonds, we release solar energy that was stored in the glucose or the fatty acids through the magic of chlorophyll, which are the little bacterium that live inside of plants that take CO2 into long chain carbon. The double carbon bond is the most efficient battery ever invented in the universe. <laughs> so this double carbon bond holds so much energy so effectively at such a atomic level down well beyond microscopic level, we cannot see double carbon bonds. This is below electron microscopy. It's the tiniest thing you can imagine. And yet it holds so much energy. And so nature, long before we showed up, figured out how to maximize the energy potential for life on Earth by chlorophyll building carbon batteries and mitochondria releasing the energy within those batteries. What we've been able to show is that glyphosate at very low levels, which is scary. You know, this so when you start to think about its debut in 1974, patented 1976, starts to go into pretty widespread use. By the 1980s, it's starting to be the primary weed killer in every single driveway every single backyard and on the farm. And this thing starts getting into our municipal water system. And I think homeowners were responsible for the initial poisoning, not even farmers. Because homeowners get a whole backpack of this stuff. And we had Super Bowl commercials of cool guys with double pistol shot weed killer coming out and they'd go and kill the five dandelions with sound effects of blowing up the dandelions and all of that. Dandelions happen to be like one of the most incredible anti-cancer foods on the planet. And we can go into that on another, another summit maybe, but it's interesting that we actually created an image of killing biology with this warlike pistol action with a chemical that would within, you know, four, <laughs> within four hours of spraying start to kill the plant. So it was a, a real, you know, head trip for the, for the masculine weed killer guy out there and <laughs> And spraying this stuff right on our driveways that we didn't realize were washing right down into our municipal water systems. And so we started poisoning each other unintentionally with this chemical in the 1980s. And you'll recall by 1986, second term of the, of the Reagan administration, Nancy Bush is put as like the face of the war on obesity. We had a new war in America and it was not against a foreign, this was now a war on obesity. And so it only took eight years from 76 to 86 to create an obesity epidemic with a chemical that shut down our ability to liberate energy from our food. And so this last six months has answered that clearly of like, how did this all begin? And it began with a collapse of our ability to make energy at the cellular level. And when you lose that ability to, to make energy at the cellular level, not only do you get obesity, well, let me finish that thought, I guess, just so in case it's not clear, you're eating lots of calories, and they're trying to get into the mitochondria to release sunlight. If they can no longer process that, then, the, then you've backed up the supply chain and now you're storing those calories in the liver and in the, then the adipose tissue of the belly and the peripheral fat. And so it's a, basically a backup in processing. It's a lot like what happened in the pandemic when we had you know 360 cargo ships in every bay in America trying to get stuff in here and we didn't have workforce to get the things off the boats. 
And so we had empty shelves, no toilet paper, no masks for our nurses because they couldn't get in. So that's exactly what's happening at the, at the molecular level when you stop the mitochondrial ability to make ATP. Now, now all the shipping containers are stuck at the liver and you can't get those unpacked because the mitochondrial workforce is sick and literally can't get to work. And so we develop obesity out of an inability to get the calories into action. So we got obese. If you maintain that situation where there's not enough energy processing, you start to lose your capacity for repair. And when your rate of injury starts to outpace your rate of repair, you get dysfunction everywhere through the system. So this is how by 1992, when we start spraying crops directly, in 1991, 92, we start spraying wheat directly with Roundup for the first time. 1993, 94, we started getting genetically modified squash and we could spray those plants direct, directly. Uh, by 96, it was corn, soybean, and all the other staples were getting genetically modified. And so 92, 93, 4, 96, now we're spraying our food directly. We're not just spraying the weeds, we're spraying the food. And so now the residues in our food are really getting high. And so we're getting exposed to more and more of this chemical in every bite of food, every drink of water. Um, somebody, I hope, has gone through what is glyphosate for you all. But yes. <laughs> you're now. glyphosate's an organophosphate salt. Uh, that disrupts uh, mitochondrial metabolism, as I've said, but it also, uh, you know, maybe way upstream of that even disrupts protein synthesis uh, through amino acid disruption. So amino acids, the building blocks for every protein in your body, there's only 22 of them. Nine of them are called essential because you can't make them. So you can't make nine of the 22 building blocks for human life. You have to get them from your food. Glyphosate disrupts directly your the, the nature's ability to make you know, about six of those essential amino acids. And so when you start misspelling proteins, you get dysfunction throughout the system. So that's how it kills a plant and that's how it kills a lot of things. But we were told, well, it's not, not enough to kill you like it would a weed that it's sprayed on, but now we're finding at these very low doses is enough to disrupt metabolism, which is to say energy production. So you start to accumulate injury when you can't repair fast enough because you have a lack of energy. Then we step into the second direct cause of how glyphosate hurts the human being directly. And this is no longer correlation of yes, lots of glyphosate and yes, lots of human disease. This is direct. So we kill the metabolism of the mitochondria and then we, we directly damage protein structure. And so not only are we not making healthy proteins from a food system that doesn't have essential amino acids, we're directly injuring the, these incredibly important protein structures that hold our body together. And one of the fundamentals are tight junctions. And so our laboratory has published peer-reviewed journals as well on this and everything else. But the, the glyphosate molecule directly breaks the tight junction. A tight junction is a complex molecule of about 13 different little proteins that come together to create something that looks like Velcro. You've got like the hook and eye kind of phenomenon that come together and they anchor two cells together. But it's not really like a spot weld or a true anchor. It's actually a, a gate and it can open and close. And that tight junction is there to regulate the, what information or what nutrients or what chemical compounds come through, first of all, the first tight junction barrier, which is the gut lining. But once inside the body, there's many tight junction barriers. There's a tight junction barrier in the, in the blood vessels between your gut and immune system there and the bloodstream to the liver. There's another tight junction system in the liver cells that then allow for further filtering. And then there's another one in all of the blood vessels that would, would occur throughout the body as those nutrients course through the body. And then there's tight junctions at the blood-brain barrier that are the most dense in the body. So that's why you think of the, the nervous system as like the holy of holies, the most protected space because it has the most tight junction layering and redundancy between it. And then you have a tight junction system of the kidneys, which is kind of your end of the road clearance of what needs to be there. We've demonstrated in our laboratory now that glyphosate damages the system at every single layer of that. And so the gut blows apart within minutes at very low concentrations of glyphosate, creating something that the public has come known as, as leaky gut. In medicine, this is referred to gut permeability uh, coefficients. And so you suddenly increase gut permeability and you can't keep out what, what should be out and you can't figure out what, what's coming in. It overwhelms the immune system behind that gut membrane. About 80% of your immune system sits in the one millimeter deep to that, that tight junction system. And so when you break that open, your immune system gets overwhelmed immediately. And you're suddenly in a full out inflammation journey every single day just to deal with food and water coming into your body. 
And so we're in a constant food fight. And this is where we develop the chronic disease epidemic, is a, it, which is a phenomenon of chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation is life-saving. A little injury happens, immune system rushes in, acute inflammation repairs it. Chronic inflammation, when you have this overwhelming stimulus every single day to injury, injury, and injury, glyphosate becomes you know, this incredible you know, gate opening you know, problem of, okay, now we have unregulated, overwhelming introduction of inflammation all the way down the line. But then it, the protein damage goes deeper. And so we've demonstrated as a laboratory that actin filaments, which are the, the structural infrastructure of the inside of the cell, as well as the outside of the cellular environment for trapping up, being up resources. So you can think of this as kind of the, the inter, interstate and intrastate <laughs> little back road highways of every state are, are the actin filaments throughout. And we've been able to demonstrate that glyphosate collapses not only the tight junctions, but also this highway system of exchange of resources. And so at these different levels, glyphosate is undermining our ability to repair. When cells start to accumulate damage, they start to become prone to cancer phenomenon. The final step of cancer is complete isolation of that cell. And that's caused by a final lysis of all the tight junctions and leaving that cell in total isolation. And we've been able to show in our lab, and we've had this on our Intelligence of Nature website, and Zach Bush MDL, everywhere we can get this, these pictures out, it's pretty amazing to see it within you know, 16 minutes of exposure, all the cells falling apart into isolation. So a chemical into our food system that creates cellular isolation and undermines metabolism for the repair action towards a healthy human body would cause a cancer epidemic, period. And so is it a carcinogen is a funny argument. And our old definition of carcinogens is based on an old understanding of what cancer was. And this is how the regulatory community, community has continued to make the wrong decision about allowing us to spray this is because they're being given science that's about 40 years old that says, well, a carcinogen has to break DNA. That's how, that's how something is cancer causing if it causes genetic injury directly. And glyphosate causes protein damage that then leads to the, the accumulation of genetic injury inside the cell. And so it's, it's a way upstream of what we thought was a carcinogen. This is a much bigger problem. It's undermining all biologic systems of repair, not just genetic injury. And so this is a new version of carcinogen, in my view. Glyphosate is now a, what I would say a, a pandemic chemical in that it is going to, for all demics, for all types of disease we can think of, it's going to be involved in the natus of that, the generative you know, quality of these epidemics, because it's undermining the very vitality of the cell that would prevent disease from happening in the first place. And so this is how we saw it all happen at once. We saw not only cancer starting to rise suddenly in the 1990s, we saw autoimmune disease, we saw neurodegenerative conditions of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's take off completely in, in our elderly population. And then we saw autism and attention deficit and all these developmental disorders and neurology of children happening all in the same hockey stick, you know, logarithmic explosions chronic inflammation in the form of chronic pain syndromes, chronic fatigue syndromes. These were diseases that weren't even named when I went through medical school. <laughs> so this all happened so fast. And, and now we have, you know, four different versions of fibromyalgia came on in the late 1990s as a term that started to be heard all the time. But now we have like six different conditions uh, that break fibromyalgia out into lots of different versions and you know, chronic regional pain syndromes and you know, RPS and RGS, and there's all these acronyms flying around now in the medical community trying to describe this maelstrom of neurologic dysfunction, autoimmune dysfunction, and the rest. So we set all of this loose by undermining the fundamentals of biology on the earth, which have to do with the way in which microbes, single cell organisms, empower multicellular organisms to do life at that scale. And by undermining that, we have seen the collapse of species. We've accelerated over the course of the, the advent, 1974 to now, <clears throat> that 40-year period, or now we're 50 years, and that's kind of daunting. Now, <laughs> yeah, that half century, um, that half century of time is was enough to 10,000-fold increase our rate of extinction of species on the planet. So now we're losing 20 every 20 minutes, another species to extinction, which means that over the short time that I've been talking, we've lost two, two to extinction. And we probably don't even know which ones those were, or what they were doing, or why they were important to the vitality of the Earth. But we are showing that we have lost about half of life on Earth over that 50 years. 
and we can predict the loss of the rest of the you know that to occur over the next hundred years. And so we're really you know being able to scientifically track the, the end of life on Earth as we understand it today, which is incredibly powerful because it comes back to one disruption of biology, which is our relationship to soil. And so for that, we launched Farmer Footprint and, and Project Biome, these large nonprofits uh, and missions around the, the world to bring attention to not just the problem, but how fast we can repair. And so it's been very exciting to show that at the human level, as soon as we take glyphosate out of the, out of the matrix and give somebody a clean food supply that has nutrient dense foods and allow their mitochondria to recover to the point where they can make ATP again, we can speed that up. And our lab has been working on extracts of bacteria and fungi and all that and how they communicate to show that actually when you take the communication network from the microbiome and put it into any human cell system, it repairs faster than ever imagined possible. We've only understood human health in the context of sterility. And so for that, we have stopped believing as a medical community over the last hundred years that healing is possible because we've never seen it happen in a Petri dish because we thought the human cell was capable. If they can heal, it should be able to do it from the human cell. By introducing the communication network or the microbiome back to petri dishes for the very first time about eight years ago, we've been able to reveal like, oh my gosh, we don't understand anything about human health because we never gave it a healthy environment to study it in. We always start, studied in sterility, which is to say always studied it in a state of dying. Everything dies when disconnected from nature. And so we only understand human biology in a death phase of disconnect from nature. And so every cancer study you've ever been shown, every basic science lab on this will study cardiovascular disease or all the fundamentals of disease that we think we understand, we have to take a big humility pill and realize, oh my gosh, we have so discounted the possibility of healing because we never gave those cells the opportunity to be in communication with their nature. And so it's very exciting for me to realize we are on the dawn of a new science of humanity within its own nature and nature within humanity. And as we allow those two to overlap again, and we start to understand science, and we're teaching children in 20 years about the interrelated and completely interdependent biology of their soil and their food and their own future, what a different world we'll live in. Those children will build houses that are not separated from nature. They will build communities that are not sterile of nature. They will build hospitals that are not sterile of nature. They will build prisons that are not sterile of nature. They will realize that if we are going to have a healthy human society, we are going to have to mimic and engage the biodiversity and beauty of the nature we were born within. And for this, I have great hope that the children that are being born now will survive long enough in their short lives that they are predicted to have to change everything and reinvent the way in which humanity is here for this. So that's a little bit of my perspective on life city and where we're at. It. I'm very excited to be with all of you because I think we're at the dawning of a new age of not only science, but human biology as, as we re-engage nature that's so willing to, to heal us so quickly. And I guess that's the, the, the caveat I didn't quite land was when you put humans in touch with healthy food, they speed, the, the speed of healing is logarithmically faster than, the, than the, the age of disrepair. It can take 20 years of cumulative injury of glyphosate to put that person in the hospital with stage four cancer. It can take just minutes for those cells to start to reconnect and for those cells to become a unified organism that we would call human again, if it's given back the microbiome. And so that gets me really excited. And now after launching Farmers Footprint, we've been in tens of thousands of farms around the world as a, as a team to find out that soil systems and, and yards and gardens and big scale farms heal in a single season of not, of you know, pause from the damage. So you don't plow and you don't spray for just one fall, one spring. And suddenly that summer, you have just an unbelievable recovery of biology that wasn't even thought possible, you know, moments before. So the speed of healing of earth, the speed of healing of a single individual logarithmically faster than the damage that occurred. So it's important for us to not become too dismal about the last 50 year journey of life say but instead see it as an incredible scientific experiment in what it means to be human. And that's why we needed the experiment. That's why we did what we did, I think, is to find out that we are not some you know, isolated species fighting against a nature that's against us to met out a little bit of sterility or a little bit of space so that we can live. We just found out over the last you know, 20 years of science that we were a, a part of the imagination of nature. 
Nature imagined us into our own existence and it's asking for our engagement to stay in play because when we do the right thing and we engage with nature through regenerative you know, efforts at the agricultural level, at the daily level, each of you, regardless of position, have the opportunity to become part of a regenerative future. And that gets me really excited because each of you making small decisions on how you're going to get nature back into your own life, it's going to change what's on your plate. It's going to change, you know, the way the people that you gather around that plate at night at the dinner table to have new conversations about, wow, I'm a banker. And I feel like now that I understand the relationship of break of nature of this, I think my bank could do something completely different. We could become part of the solution. I'm giving keynote talks this weekend with some of the biggest, you know, family, seven generation family, you know, companies that dictate the modern food system and are thought of as like kind of Darth Vader of the food system. They are waking up and saying, how can we, we have this huge machine and we didn't know what we were doing. Nobody knew what life today was going to do. We didn't know this was going to be a problem. Now that we do, can't we all be part of this exciting, you know, solution of this regenerative movement? How do we become not only part of the solution, but maybe a driver of change? And so you've got the biggest food systems in the world that are appropriately looked at as, as dark forces in, in biology and, and human and human life, too. A lot of humanitarian you know, abuses have been done in, in the food system for thousands of years. The food system has largely been built on slave labor for tens of thousands of years. How do we break the back of the belief that food has to be difficult to produce? Food has to, to come out of extractive human labor. It's to realize that nature is trying to provide for us in her own way. And our micromanagement of her has made it difficult to have food. If we release food for us within every city in, in this world, there will never be starvation again. Food forests are the most dynamic, resilient, regenerative machines out there, and nobody needs to starve when there's food in every street, every street corner, every park is booming with thousands of versions of nuts, seeds, legumes, berries, fruits coming out of our very ecosystems that we live within. Your backyard garden, the lawn, is the third largest crop in America. We have 40 million acres of lawn, which does not feed a soul, which actually destroys the soil ecology underneath it. It creates monoculture where there's supposed to be biodiversity. When we stop planting lawns and we start building food forests in every backyard and we see every piece of soil as an opportunity to maximize biodiversity, then we will have this regenerative future that we all know in our hearts is possible. I think I'll close with just a Wendell Berry quote. And Wendell Berry, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, he said, until we see every space as sacred, we will only know desecrated spaces. And that's so important for us. You know, we're putting so much money into, you know, saving Machu Picchu or this national forest over here, whatever it is. Until you realize that the sacredness of your backyard or the stoop out front of your apartment is the sacred space that you get to engage every day. You're gonna, you're gonna only know the desecration of a planet that is unobserved, unseen in her beauty, unseen in her capacity for biodiversity and healing. And so that's that's I think my perspective on life is saying I appreciate that being shared. Thank you, Tom. Well, thank you, Zach. And uh, you know, as as I was listening, particularly to your closing remarks, it reminded me of uh, a conversation with Dr. Sylvia Earle last February where we were talking about the you know 300 gigatons of excess CO2 in the atmosphere and the million species on the endangered species list. And uh, she's had an extraordinary life. And I just, I asked her, I said, what, what brings you hope at this point after your life's work? And she said, you know, for the first time in human history, we now know. Yes. And as you were speaking, you know, what, what was very exciting to me was you've provided the information that we we didn't know. And with that, uh, you can have the conversations that you're having with uh, the largest food producers in the world to help educate and inform them and get them to, uh, to shift the way that they're operating their businesses. That's beautiful. I really, you know, I, I'm eager to take questions if, if that's the next thing, I guess, but I, I would, well, if questions are coming in, um, point out just the opportunity we have with that CO2 in the atmosphere. Never before have we had more carbon available for biology. 
Yeah. And bizarrely, <laughs> the companies we need to thank for that are ExxonMobil, BP, and Shell, these companies that have done so much decimating injury to the planet inadvertently created the greatest opportunity biology has ever had on the planet because we've never had so much carbon above ground. That means we can have the greenest, most verdant planet in the Earth's history of 4 billion years could happen in the next 200 years. Literally that fast in 4 billion year history, humans may have just done the journey that the planet most needed to become its most expressive beauty. And so I really want everybody to release judgment on human behavior because I don't even think we know why we're doing what we're doing because there's maybe a bigger chess game at hand that may be Mother Earth expressing life at her fullest capacity. And she needed the injury to create the repair at the level that it's going to be done. And so the oil companies and the food companies that have destroyed 97% of the arable lands of the earth, we needed the 97% injury to create the next explosion of life, which is gonna be made possible by two demonized phenomena, which is carbon in the atmosphere and viruses in every niche of, of biology. Viruses are literally the biologic language of possibility. Viruses are the biologic language of possibility. These are new versions of old genes that have been re, reformed, rewritten, to shape the next expression of life on Earth. After each of the last extinctions, there's been five before this one we're in the midst of now, life returns more beautiful, more biodiverse, and always more intelligent. And so in the event we do go extinct, I think we are still part of the, the beautiful plan to bring forth something even more beautiful than, than dolphins and blue whales and humans. What comes from the jump from reptiles to an extinction to birds and mammals and humans What's the next jump look like? If we got from a dinosaur to a human, what does that next leap of intelligence and creative capacity look like for a human Earth that now has 10 to the 31 viruses in the air, which is you know, more than stars in the entire universe, 10 to the 30 viruses down in the seawater, 10 to the 31 viruses in the soil beneath our feet. We are so surrounded by new life potential in the form of the virome. And to find out that humans in our mere 20,000 genes that we have, we, we're, we're very, very simple creatures from a genetic standpoint. We sit between a fruit fly and a flea. Fruit fly has 13,000 genes, flea has 30,000 genes, we come in at 20. And so we're between a free, flea and a fruit fly genetically. And yet we are able to express so much intelligence, not because of the human genes, but because the human body has been designed to hold the most complex ecosystem ecosystem of any other biology on Earth. Our colon holds more biodiversity than any other ecosystem on Earth. And for that, we express huge genetic intelligence, huge expression of beauty and intelligence as a species, because it's not just us speaking. It is the microbiome speaking through us, through this perfect organic garden that makes us into our full potential there. So I'm, I'm very curious. Um your optimism, your way of seeing the world, your way of understanding, where, where does that come from? It's inside of each of us is this inexplicable little pressure that, feel, that I would call optimism, but it is a pressure. It, it is something that drives us to the next thing. From a psycho-spiritual standpoint, I believe that if there's any trait that you could point to humans to say that we are of something greater than ourselves, the trait would be curiosity. I believe that curiosity is literally the, the sign that we are part of a creative force in the universe. We are some sort of face of some sort of divine, we could call it divine or God, we could call it all kinds of different things, but there's some sort of force within the universe that makes it syntropic. Syntropy is the opposite of entropy. Entropy is chaos, syntropy is order out of chaos. We have a syntropic planet. Syntropy is the expression of more and more complexity and systems of beauty within vacuum space that is you know, completely unordered. And so we have a syntropic planet, which is to say there's some sort of force of design behind everything. And we are some sort of hands of that machine, I believe, for the curiosity that drives creativity within humanity. And that gets me very curious to see what are we going to create next? Now that you all have the information you've heard on this whole summit, what are you going to go create? What do you want your grandchildren's lives to look like? What do you want their homes to look like? What do you want their gardens to look like? 
Do you want them to know how to garden? Because right now we're growing 0.1% of our food in our backyard garden. We were growing 40% of our food in our backyard gardens in 1945. And so we, we have forgotten how to garden and therefore we have forgotten who we are. And there's an opportunity for us to rediscover our identity and our purpose perhaps in the soils of the earth. Yeah, I, I recall uh, looking around at, at some of the data um, at the beginning of the last century, over 90% of all Americans were living on family farms. And now we've got uh, two or 3% of our population involved in the uh, the direct growing of, of food that we rely on. And uh, that disconnection, and, and we look at the uh, the transition that our society went through over the last 100 years is extraordinary. And in, in a very um, detrimental way. So with uh, yeah, so with with the uh, the the three hundred plus gigatons of CO two that uh, the petroleum industry has gifted to humanity, and I've yeah. I've never held it that way before. Uh, we've lost over half the topsoil on the planet. So how do we how do we bring that topsoil or that carbon back into the topsoil and restore? Uh, the restore the planet. I know some of the work you're doing is is actually making that a reality. Yeah, so there's a few different tiers of this impact and it's super simple, fortunately. Like it sounds like a catastrophically difficult situation. Yeah, 97% of Earth's arable soil is depleted or severely depleted of nutrients in life. Yeah, it turns out that you know just a moment of doing the right thing uh, speeds us into this recovery phase. And so um, there's certainly, um, human activities that can be uh, you know, harnessed to accelerate this repair rate on the earth. But the, my most excitement is actually around keystone species that are not human. And so uh, Project Biome is our nonprofit globally that's putting together a cohesive vision on how we rapidly repair earth. And that has to do with Africa. If we don't fix Africa, we, we go into extinction. And this has not been talked about enough. There's been a lot of focus on the Amazon rainforest, and that's the lung of the planet, and all this language has been thrown together. There, there are two lungs of the planet called it South Africa or Africa and South America. And, and those two lungs of the planet have multiple functions, you know, in the way in which they move everything, carbon and water cycles around the planet. Um, but until we recognize the two lungs and the, the much larger of the two, twice the land mass is Africa. And Africa also sits at this crucial energetic stage of the planet that allowed biodiversity to occur. So all of life, if you recall maybe the history books there, all of life came out of the Rift Valley, which is you know basically a meridian that runs from South Africa up to Egypt. And that single meridian is where all of the biodiversity of plants and microbes and so came from. And there's very specific reasons it comes from there geologically, energetically on the planet, you know, where the little gravitational vortices are within the planet, all this stuff. So it was very predictable, ultimately, if we could see with enough intelligence, you know, back in the day that life would spring out of this spot. We now know that life spring out of that spot, and yet we're giving no international attention to regenerating that, that corridor. And we have rivers drying out to desertification all up and down that system. And so we have a vision for the five rivers of Africa, but that really becomes a template for the whole world to do the following. Rewild rivers. Rewilding is a process of getting keystone species back into those river systems to get the water to run again. And it's pretty dramatic how fast this happens. This isn't theoretical. This, this is real and measured. In the United States alone, we've demonstrated that just reintroduction of beavers into the desert river systems of the South immediately got those rivers to re-green and start to flow again. A seemingly completely disparate, you know, not as obvious as a beaver living in the river, the wolves reintroduced, reintroduced to Yellowstone got the rivers flowing again. In Texas, massive desert system. Uh, we've desertified more of Texas than any other part of the United States over the last 20 years, uh, creating thousands of miles of new desert there as, as the water tables dry up. The rivers have gone dry. And I was just outside of Austin last Earth Day um, at a bison ranch that has reintroduced multi-generational bison uh, populations to the region. And within a year, the rivers start flowing under the hooves of the bison. And so the regenerative agriculture is super effective and fast at doing a lot of things. But I have never seen a farm do the repair that these animals can do in such speed. So unleashing nature into her nature again is going to require a cooperative effort to reintroduce species that have gone extinct. 
and it's working. I mean, beavers went extinct in, in, the, in the UK in the 1960s. They have now been thoroughly reintroduced to many regions within the UK and rivers are flowing clean again. There's less flooding, there's less drought. All the right things are happening. In, in South Africa, where I'm focusing a lot of my efforts right now, we see the reintroduction of, of white lions back in the territory that allow for the biology to return to soil systems and the like. So lots of excitement that these species already know how to, to interact with nature to heal her at a rate that we haven't figured out how to do yet, which suggests we're not actually a keystone species. <laughs> we are an invasive malignancy on the planet right now, not understanding who we are. When we become a keystone species, Earth will thrive under our feet instead of be destroyed under our feet. And so right now, my biggest excitement for Africa is the elephants. We have 200,000 excess elephants that have inexplicably proliferated in Botswana. Elephants never grow past their food system, and they have by 200,000 elephants in just 10 years. That's a mystery to science right now, but not when you look at this bigger picture of Africa. It turns out that each elephant drops 25 tons of organic material per acre per year, 25 tons of topsoil recovery per acre per year per elephant. Multiply that by 200,000 elephants, and you realize that over the next 10 years, if we unleash the elephants of Africa back into the river systems, we will completely repair the carbon water cycles of Africa and therefore the planet in extremely short order. So rewilding rivers with corridors of regenerative agriculture around those rivers so that the farmers can become part of the solution, not the problem. We can create biodiversity within city systems of Africa, so all the new townships cropping up. We can create food sovereignty, food sustainability, and food force design of towns instead of just concrete municipalities that speed desertification. Then around the regenerative agricultural systems, we see the opportunity to seed Africa and the world with regenerative technologies that allow for distributed economic wellness. And that's going to be distributed things like energy. And so we've been working on a company called Bio, uh, Resource Dynamics for the last seven years that basically you've designed a 40-foot mitochondria to digest plastics, tires, and farm waste into biodiesel, just like the mitochondria take long chain of carbon into energy. We saw the opportunity to do that at scale. So Resource Dynamics is now working with with, with officials in India and Africa and other places to start at scale, really rolling out this technology so that rural communities can take what was previously a poisoning waste and turn it into fuel sovereignty. So not only do you have food sovereignty, you have energy sovereignty. And I believe at that moment, you change global economics and the future of humanity. If humanity has food sovereignty and you know unfettered access to, to energy, we will create a new universe. And, and it's a very exciting opportunity uh, for us to do that. So, that's the threefold vision I have, rewilding rivers, regenerative agriculture, and regenerative distributed economics. It's extraordinary that uh, you've, you've taken these disparate, seemingly disparate systems and thinking and technology to, uh, to think more holistically about what, what is it that the planet needs and have, have brought them together, not just uh, from a theoretical perspective, but actually doing something on the ground. We are we are launching. If you if you want to go to uh, projectbiome.org and and contribute, we'd love to have your support. But in April on Earth Day, uh, we are uh, laying the first seed event in a, a rural community called Timbavadi, uh, region of South Africa, in a town called Acorn Hook, and uh, we are launching a community program where the community itself maps its wealth in regards to biodiversity, right? not just of the plants and all that, but the biodiversity of the humans within that community to realize they are rich. Despite the poverty that appears there, they are rich in human resources and biologic resources that could give them autonomy if it were known. And so this mapping program is really at the heart of letting humanity see how beautiful we are and see how much capacity we have to be regenerative organisms as communities as we are regenerative bodies as a human. And so um, Acorn Hook, uh, that project of seed, uh, go to Project Biome. You can look at Farmer's Footprint, uh, which is one of our projects within Project Biome. Farmersfootprint.us. We also launched Australia, farmersfootprint.org.au. Uh, we have uh, UK, New Zealand, and South Africa uh, all launching Farmers Footprints in the next few months. So there's now a global movement to support this that you guys can all get engaged with. And as you become engaged in that, you're going to hear the stories of farmers that are, are healing. And that's been our focus as, as a group is to be storytellers for those voices that are doing, doing the magic beneath their own feet and telling the success that they have economically mental health, financial, all these levels just repair so rapidly for these farmers globally as they become active agents of transformation and, and cooperative you know, generation with their planet. And the speed of recovery is beautiful. 
Can you uh, can you share a, a bit about your own personal journey, how it is that you got to this this point in the work that you're doing, and and some of the things, the choices you've made in your personal life about how you're how you're existing on the planet? That would take a very long time to answer. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, the short thing is, you know, I spent 17 years in academic medicine studying, you know biochemistry, cell biology. I was developing chemotherapy at the University of Virginia by 2005, 10 rate range. And um, during that time, we were starting to get murmurs out of the genomics that, oh my gosh, cancer is related to the microbiome of the gut. And literally we would sit around laughing at, about these articles coming out of you know, the hippie, hippie communities in California and all this. We were just, we were taunting it because it did not fit at all our understanding of how cancer occurs or what it would be. And I was still very much believed that cancer was something attacking humanity. You know, I really saw it as that. I didn't realize it was a humanity expressing its own disconnect. And so everything I've told you today, I've discovered in the last you know, 12 years after leaving the university. And I had to get out of the academic environment to start to ask the questions that were relevant to my patients ultimately, because I was being paid to ask irrelevant questions uh, through my research. I was a, a global expert in a protein called PUP-TF1. Nobody's ever heard of that protein. Nobody ever will because it's irrelevant. But that's the only way I was going to be paid is if I became an expert in an irrelevant thing. That was so niche example. I could say, you should give me right because I'm the only person that understands this protein. And therefore, I would get the grant. And so we've been so reductionist in, about, in our education and the way in which we fund research that nobody is allowed to ask the big question. Like nobody in academia is allowed to ask, like, why is, why is the world dying? Nobody's asking, you know, like, why is Africa going into desert? Why is Texas going into desert? Like, instead, we're saying, oh, well, you can go ask us, ask about the rivers of Texas, but God forbid, you don't know anything about soil. You can't ask about that. You're not an expert in soil. You can't go talk about that. So I had to leave academia before I could even start to put the dots together to, to create the narrative that I was born to today required me to get far enough away from my subject that I could have some perspective of what was happening in the landscape around my subject of cancer. And so that's now been my joy is I've been given the gift of incredible teams around me. Everything I've told you is discovered by some brilliant person on my team, not me. And so these teams have been attracted to the possibility that not only could we find a root cause, we could find the root solutions. And these teams have come around, which has allowed me to continue to rise in my perspective. And so I can keep going up and up and up and looking further and further down at the, at the system. And all I can see is the same patterns at every fractal. What I learned in the cancer cell is absolutely happening at the planetary scale right now. And for that, we're having an extinction event. And so it's been a joy to find out that truth is fractal from the atomic level to the molecular level to the cellular level, to the human level to the planetary level. It's all the same truth. Life occurs due to biodiversity and its connectivity. If we allow for biodiversity to occur, we will live long and prosper. <laughs> I, uh, I had a, an opportunity to work with a, a scientific team in uh, Switzerland a, a couple of years ago. Um, and they started their research by getting private funding to ask a fundamental question, how many trees are there on the planet? And uh, it reminds me of what you just shared, that getting out of the traditional academic environment, uh, you can become liberated to ask the kinds of questions that are just basic and fundamental that need to be asked without any constraints. And from there, magic can happen. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think we, we're seeing a pivot now. I think, you know, we just saw COP27 happen in climate change, you know, summit with all the governments and presidents flying in to give their, their take on, on how we're going to heal the planet. 27 of those have not changed the trajectory of humanity. And so I think we're realizing now that ideas never come from governments, but governments can receive ideas. And so as a population, it's time for us to bring the good ideas to our governments and say, here's the path forward. We need regulatory environments and we need legislative decisions that will support this path, but we don't expect governments to fix this problem anymore. If we keep expecting the United Nations to fix it, we will, we will die. We will go extinct. But the United Nations can become part of the solution by understanding the goal. And so it's as a science community, as consumers, our opportunity is to, to really crystallize the narrative of where we're going and how we're gonna get there. And we're very excited about the simplicity uh, that we have discovered, which is rewild rivers, regenerative agriculture, and distributed economic opportunities. And, and with those three things, 
the whole fabric of human society, the empire building and falling and all this stuff, that all goes away because nobody's hungry and everybody has unfettered access to, to energy. And in that, we can create unfettered access to information, which then would create a biologic system that we would call human for the first time, perhaps. We've been so fractured, so poorly communicating between the factions of humanity. Uh, war has been our history rather than biology. And so uh, we, we have a biologic future if we let go of the warring mind mentality of humanity. You know. And how uh, how has your information, your research been received? We, you know, we heard on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week, um, the industry attacks um, and the uh, the personal attacks going against the attorneys, the scientists, and the the journalists. Um, what what has been the uh, the result of your work, and how has it been received, whether it's by regulators or government officials or industry? Well, it, it may not make a whole lot of sense, but at this point, I can only assume that my information has been received perfectly. <laughs> just to say that it has been received exactly as it should to create enough friction to create change. So um, I have no judgment on those who have rejected me or attacked me because they're just part of the part of this journey of, of, of humans discovering humans uh, and human, humanity discovering its own humanity. And so my, my information lands perfectly. It's disruptive information. It forces change and humans inherently do not like change. So we figure out all kinds of systems to resist change. And so the resistance that we see around the information that's been shared this week, not just mine, is natural. It is natural to our psychology and philosophy. So we shouldn't see that as a failure. We should see that as a natural process. And now we just need to iterate. And if we tell the narrative long enough, the whole thing changes. And it is changing dramatically. Like when we started Farmers for Print, nobody had heard of Regenerative. When we started you know, talking about glyphosate, nobody had ever heard of it. Now we're having huge summits on glyphosate. Like, you know, but it, it, we have a long ways to go. And, and in some ways that is reassuring to me because I, I was recently with six senators in the U.S. Congress, 6% of our entire you know, Senate sitting in one room for two and a half hours around this topic. They happened to all sit on the Ag Committee and the, you know, and the Appropriations Committee for Ag. So these are the people that are currently legislating and funding our current food system, agriculture system, chemical agriculture environment. Three of those six people had never heard the word glyphosate before. And so I want to emphasize that because it's such good news that people aren't against us. I don't believe the government's against, they just don't know what you guys now know after these few days on this glyphosate summit. And so your job is not to expect you know, DC or any other government to fix it. How are you going to become part of the solution and take that solution to government? They're looking for solutions desperately because they want to get reelected and they're honestly good people that want to see something good happen from their careers. They would love a positive legacy. They're tired of building negative legacies of they threw so many people under the bus that they survived in politics. Nobody actually feels good about that at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. They want to have a legacy that they can say to their grandchildren, look what I did over a 40 year career in government. And they're just like me and you and everything else is we all want to feel important. We all want to sense purpose within our lives and we want to die with a sense of fulfillment on some level. And we want to acknowledge our shortcomings, all those things, but we want that sense of fulfillment. And every government agent out there is just a human waiting for that experience. And I believe this narrative is giving them the opportunity to participate in that future. And so uh, everything is being resi resisted appropriately so that it can then be iterated again and discovered. Um, it's that classic cartoon, you know, the, the process of change is stupid, idiot, you know, and then the last slide is obvious. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> and so we are going from the stupid and shut up and, and the glyphosate to obviously glyphosate. And so uh, it's very exciting that we are recognizing, obviously, when we started pouring 4 billion pounds of a chemical into our soil systems every year, we did some damage. And so the, the obvious is starting to emerge, which means we're going to start collaborating and co-creating together. Well, I, I hear a, a tremendous amount of resiliency in, in what you shared today, just your personal resiliency and in a, a sense of uh, your personal philosophy. And I, I'm curious, um, what is your, what's the driver of, of, of Zach Bush and who are you and where does that come from? I've discovered a lot of the answers to those questions the last couple of years, and it's been the most beautiful thing I can imagine. Um, 
the most beautiful thing I've ever seen on the planet now is me. And I hope that each of you get to discover that. There's so much beauty in each of you. And this is what brings me to tears over and over again. There's so much beauty in each of you. And you've been blinded to your own beauty and you've been blinded to your own capacity for change, your capacity for transformation, your capacity to be a creative force that you are in great pain and you are lonely on some deep level. And I think it's 100% of you out there because I include myself in that 100% of us feel deeply unseen and lonely at some level. And so uh, that breaks my heart for humanity. But without that heart breaking, we don't know how big of the heart is and we don't feel it until it's broken. And in our breaking heart of a humanity going extinct, I think we will find the loves for ourselves that we desperately been needing to rediscover. And uh, the hope within me is born out of my heartbreak. The, uh, the beauty that I now see in myself has come out of a necessary life path that I created for myself such that I would give up on all external metrics of success, stop looking to occupations and careers and projects and relationships as my metric for success and start to measure success at my own coherence with self. And uh, the beauty that comes out of that, that recalibration to your success at the single level of your value. You are a complete being, fully realized, fully embodied, fully in its purpose by just its presence within the biologic matrix of life on earth. You are a mathematical miracle. There's no way you could occur. It's, it's physically and it's just physically, spiritually <laughs> impossible that you exist, if not for the fact that you are a part of a centropic, centropic experience or expression of the universe in high purpose. And each of you are here with 7.8 billion strong around you, 7.8 billion souls. And now that we know what we know about mitochondria, it turns out we know that we are light being. We are emanating so much light out of every single cell because the mitochondria are breaking the carbon bonds. And it's now understood that a cubic centimeter of mitochondria can create 10,000 times more light than a cubic centimeter of the surface of the sun. And so we have 7.8 billion souls that can burn 10,000 times brighter than the sun on a single planet floating in the dark, vast space. And I believe there must be eyes out there that can see us, that can see how bright we're burning. Because we are a centropic planet, we must not be alone. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Any system left in isolation will increase entropy. We are increasing our centropy on planet Earth again and again and again. And so we must not be alone. And we must be seen by something benevolent and beautiful in this universe. And I'm just so honored to be one of those beings that represents a solar flare here on Earth at this moment of hope at this moment of possibility that we all have in us. And uh, it's just a real privilege and honor to be alive right now. And I'm so glad each of you picked this moment because you are so beautifully expressing something so great, so much greater than yourself, but also so great in yourself. It is your beauty that we are here to see. And each of you are beautiful in such a deep way. I hope that you can feel it in your in your bloodstream right now, bubbling up in you of like an overwhelming knowing that you are that beautiful and yet you had been suppressing that and it should be causing tears in your eyes right now to realize how hard you've been trying to suppress your own beauty. Why are you doing that? Why are you suppressing it? It's because we're afraid of change. Because if we really saw how beautiful each of us were, my God, would we create a different world? Would we just create a different place? And don't we want that place for our grandchildren? Don't we want that place for the species of animals that would be abundant in the universe there? So it's a fearful thing to realize how far we've separated ourselves from our own beauty and nature. And it's a beautiful thing to welcome it back in. And it takes a split second to do it. And you're all feeling it inside yourselves right now. And I just, I honor each of you in, in realizing how beautiful you are. Thank you, Zach. Um, Jim, I'd like to invite you back in to... Uh into the conversation. Thank you, Tom. Zach, thank you. Your brilliance and your clarity has been uh, deeply insightful today. And I think as we bring this program to a close, I'd like to just ask you to share your advice uh, at a personal 
level to us all, knowing that probably all of us have glyphosate somewhere in our internal ecosystem. Um, we see Roundup all around, even in Marin County, where I, I live, they use it on the headlands. Um, what would be your advice as, as conscious people uh, to remediate? Do you have a particular diet that you recommend? Do you, do you just focus on eating organically? Uh, should we all be taking probiotics to, to optimize our microbiome? I mean, just at a kind of a physical health level, what's your advice to people, given the situation of toxicity, um, how we can regenerate and refortify uh, as best that we can? Yeah, this is another massive topic. So um, I'll give you some cliff notes, but this is going to be far yeah. from, from comprehensive here. But um, I'll tackle it at the bacteria level and then we'll get up to the food, I guess. You, you mentioned probiotics and, and probiotics were a very important advent of understanding the possibility that bacteria were not all bad, which was certainly our belief, you know, previous to this era. Um, so it was helpful in, in changing the dynamics or relationship to our understanding of bacteria. But unfortunately, probiotics uh, have been shown to be as damaging as antibiotics to our microbiology. Uh, three very conclusive studies were published finally in 2018. A lot of evidence had preceded that, but I feel like it was at that moment in September of 2018, these three very large studies, very beautifully designed, were published all at the same time in Cell, which is one of our most uh, revered science journals. And in that, we saw that after two weeks of antibiotics, uh, individuals and animals randomized to fecal transplant, which is encapsulated stool that was collected before the antibiotic, or control, meaning the placebo, or a probiotic had three very different courses of recovery. With fecal transplant, human and mouse recovered within three, three and a half weeks. With placebo, no probiotic, no bacteria, it recovers at four weeks. With a probiotic, at six months, it still hasn't recovered. The probiotic actually froze recovery at the same place, basically, wow. that the antibiotic had caused. And when you start to think about biodiversity, it's pretty obvious why that happens, is that the probiotic has 50 to 70 billion copies. In fact, this is part of the marketing probiotic. We have more copies. We have 70 billion copies of these three good species. The human gut is supposed to be a living ecosystem that finds its own dynamics and balance every single second, let alone every single day, let alone every single season. And it should be dynamic and changing all the time. Season to season, we should have a really dramatic change in our microbiome for the different types of foods that come in seasonally, for the different temperatures of those foods that come in seasonally, for the different dynamics of the, the micromolecules in those foods when they're growing in the middle of summer versus root vegetables in the middle of winter. We simply have a different nutrient surrounding us with each season. You take three species of probiotic and some are now seven species or 24 species, whatever they say. A healthy human gut is 40,000 species working in concert in a constantly dynamic and iterative form of, of expression of more biodiversity. And so we now have a $47 billion probiotic industry globally that is teaching old science that there's three or seven good species of bacteria. Mm. Are good. There's not a single bad guy in, out there, and this is very hard for doctors to, you know, embrace because we see invasive infections of MRSA or BRE or these drug-resistant bacteria. Those are simply expressions of loss of biodiversity, and this is what happens on farms. If you create enough sterility, weeds occur. Weeds are the process of rebiodiversifying something that needs to repair its biodiversity. If you immediately see the weed as the enemy and you go kill that, well, there's going to have to be more weeds next year because you did it again. And this is the problem farmers are at in Midwest now that are forcing them to change their regenerative practices. There's no chemicals left to kill the weeds that are growing because the situation is so desperate. And when they stop spraying for a single season and go to biodiversity crop of 30 cover crop seeds, there's no weeds the next year. One year, they're all gone because they are no longer needed. And so this is what's going to happen in hospitals. When we build hospitals that don't believe in sterility as the path to human health and embrace microbiome at every level, there's not going to be any infections. An infection is inherently a symptom of a disconnect from the natural biodiversity of nature, period. You get a viral infection, you get a bacterial infection, that is symptomatic of you being disconnected from nature. You can tell by our public health interventions is that our response to an infection is go get more isolated from nature. And therefore we get sicker 
and we get sicker and we get sicker as we isolate and isolate out of fear of a nature that seems to be attacking us. Nature is trying to welcome us back into her caring and nurturing arms. And when we receive her, if we're willing to receive from her, which would mean that you would have to be willing to see how beautiful you are, willing to see how miraculous a being you are, that nature would even wash you here. Wow, how special you must be. How exquisitely special you must be. How valuable you must be that 70 trillion human cells would be nurtured by 14 quadrillion mitochondria nurtured by 1.4 quadrillion bacteria of 30,000 different species within your body. How important must you be if nature is working that hard to make you beautiful? And so it's really, you know, letting go of our symptom management and starting to embrace a holistic understanding of the beauty of nature and the regenerative quality of nature, which means death is always part of the cycle. And uh, that's what you learn first on a farm is death happens all the time. But my last step, especially in medicine, was hospice. And I can tell you that there was never a hospice death that I saw that looked like an endpoint. It is a rebirth every time. And humanity is going to rebirth in one shape or another. Outside the body, inside the body, we'll choose. But if it is an extinction event, we have to realize that by that time, eight, eight and a half billion souls will be in a symphony of release, a symphony of our energetic re-embodiment of our full potential as we let go of these bodies. A hospice moment is a rebirth and humanity is in its hospice moment. We've been given our death sentence. And the question is, will we be awake and be grateful for the life we were given and therefore die in joy and gratitude? Or will we say, oh, I can just simply change my lifestyle and I'll get discharged from hospice, which is 10% of our hospice patients had to be discharged from hospice because as soon as they were told they were going to die, they were like, oh, I should do something else. And they change everything. <laughs> And then they go on to live 10 years. <laughs> and so it's like, either we're going to be the 10% that get discharged, or we're going to accept in gratitude and love our death. And each of those paths are equally holy and equally beautiful, because ultimately both are a rebirth. Uh, one is a rebirth within the body, and one is a rebirth with the release of the body. And so we, we have no bad outcome as humanity. We return to our beauty in either way. But selfishly, I kind of like being finite. I love being able to see the steam rise off my tea in the morning. It's freaking beautiful. I love seeing the sunlight come through my daughter's hair. That's freaking exquisite to witness. And I don't think I'll be able to see it in the same way when I let go of this body with its five senses. So from a selfish standpoint of my capacity to see beauty within every person around me, I hope we stay to play, but we'll have to wake up and love each other into our future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been brilliant. Thank you. Appreciate that to be with you all. Thank you. Tom, do you want to say a closing word and then tee us up for tomorrow? Um, I, I, I'll share a couple of things. So, um, Zach, I had high expectations for our conversation today and you exceeded them as I suspected you would. <laughs> Um, and, and secondly, I just, I'm really grateful for the week we've had and looking forward to our, our time together tomorrow to summarize and, and wrap up the week. It uh, feels like it's been an important conversation, important set of dialogues to help inform and, uh, and share with folks, um, what's, what, what we as a species have been doing on the planet and to each other whether it's our agriculture systems, our food systems, the legal systems, our academic systems, et cetera. And uh, just happy that we've been able to, uh, to be in this conversation this week. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Zach. That brings our, our program to a close, everyone. Uh, we'll see you in the after session chat. Those of you who can make it, you'll see the link in the chat box. And we'll then tomorrow have our final session where we'll summarize the extraordinary evidence about glyphosate and what we as human beings can do to refortify ourselves and renew our physical and psychological health uh, to bring forth a more abundant future. Zach Bush, thank you. Brilliant. Bye, everyone.